This is New Orleans today. For more than 200 years, mistress of the Mississippi, queen of the Gulf. Traditionally known the world over as a sleepy land of dreams and Mardi Gras, blues and bouillabaisse, jazz and jambalaya. The Vieux Carré, the French Quarter, practically deserted by day, crowded with thrill seekers and tourists by night. But in the last dozen years, New Orleans has come wide awake, full of ambition made itself the second largest port in the United States, next to New York. Annually, 3,000 ships use the fine harbor facilities, handling nearly $2 billion worth of cargo. Fortunately, so far, the port of the legendary Jean Lafitte has been free of the dock pirates and racketeers who have been stealing $250 million a year in New York Harbor alone. Has New Orleans been painstakingly vigilant or just plain lucky? Senator Ellender of Louisiana has this to say. A $2 billion bonanza is an inevitable temptation to criminals. This picture shows how waterfront felons might attempt to infiltrate even a fine, carefully policed port like New Orleans. Once they get a foothold, it requires the most earnest unflagging effort by public-spirited citizens to root them out, as you will see in this motion picture. The modern port of New Orleans still employs the shape-up, a day-to-day -day casual hiring system. The shape-up has been called an open invitation to waterfront criminals. But in New Orleans, this hiring system seems to be working out. Yeah. H. Gillings. Yeah. 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 All right, take your lift tractor and start with that pile over there. Hi, Peterson. Mr. Temple. You running a tour service, Riley? No, nope, just bringing my boys on the job. Who we take two men and put them on that crane back there and see how many lifts you need? This is not Pacific Street Wharf, Riley. What do you think you're doing? Did Mr. Temple tell you? I was hoping this wouldn't happen. Zero Saxon's just contracted to unload all Golden Gulf ships. Here, take a look. You have the Golden Gulf contract, Mr. Temple. Hey, Bud, uh, can you tell me where I can find the Delta surplus and salvage yard? Apparently, I had the contract. Looks like Zero underbid me. You gonna let Zero take over this wharf and put our guys out of work? They ain't gonna be in no condition away tonight. That's what you think. The administration building of the Port of New Orleans, shortly after the riot, a committee from the Stevedores Contractors Association entered a complaint. Wayne Brandon, an executive of the Port Commission, presided at the special hearing. Frank Bauer, president of Cheney Steamship Lines, was seated next to Howard Temple, the complainant. Jack Petty, business agent for the Longshoremen, and Al Chittenden, president of ILA, were invited. Also, Robert Chambers, representing the cargo insurance companies. Gentlemen, we all regret the occasion that brings us here, but I can assure you that the committee is going to do everything it possibly can to get to the bottom of this transaction. I'm assuming, of course, Mr. Saxon, that you are paying fair rates. Well, we check Mr. Saxon's wars regularly. Every man gets every penny he's entitled to. The committee finds no evidence of malpractice. The committee cannot act. 
Mr. Saxon could be investigated. Oh, no, not again. Our ships have been using Zero Saxon stevedore operations for years, and we're satisfied. However, we've paid more insurance claims for pilfered cargo on Mr. Saxon's docks than on all the rest of the harbor. And investigation... Just one minute, Mr. Chambers. That ain't exactly accurate. I've been investigated so much... It... Let's talk facts. Did anybody report any stealing? But the lost claims. Lost cargo, Mr. Chambers, ain't pilferage. Check the drivers that pick up the wrong loads, or check the stuff that's supposed to be loaded on ships in foreign ports and ain't. If any of my workers are caught stealing, I'd crack down harder than any of you would. And the union will back me up on this, right, Al? Sure thing. Under the circumstances, I'm afraid that there's nothing that we can do or say, Mr. Temple. That will be all, Mr. Saxon. You, Mac? Yeah. What can I do for you? I'm Dan Corbett. I wrote you from Los Angeles about this. Oh, you're that ex sailor. I thought maybe you were a crackpot or something. Say, you mean to tell me you came all the way down here to buy an LSM? Your ad says $4,500 practically buys a ship. I'll take care of the balance later. I got the $4,500. There she is. And this is the stack off of her. I use it for my office. But I guess I can change offices. You want to go take a look at her? Yeah. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I'm sure I can fix her up. You want cash, or will the check be all right? Uh, take it easy, kid. What do you want with this old scrap heap? I figure a surplus LSM can haul yellow pine from places other boats can't get to. Then I'll sell the lumber up and down the Mississippi. Might work at that. Back in California, a couple of guys out of San Pedro picked up a surplus LSM. They hauled timber down from the Northwest down to L.A. You know how much business they did in their first year? Hmm. A million bucks. You know that personally, or did you read it? The money I'm going to give you is going to clean me out. I got to have more to fit her out and shape her up. Yeah, and for the rest of the payments. Huh. Let's call the deal off. No, I can raise the money. How soon can I have the ownership papers? Just as soon as I can get some ink for this old fountain pen of mine. You sure you want to go through with this deal? Yep, I'm sure. OK. She's yours. It's a deal. Now I gotta get myself a job. I'm gonna stay near my boat, work on her whenever I get a chance. Ever try the docks? The docks? You call that work? What I've seen all I do down there is fight. Oh, you haven't seen them in their better moments, when they're relaxing. Do I have to? Wait a minute. I got something. Yeah, here it is. One of the longshoremen gave me a ticket to their picnic out at Pontchartrain Beach tomorrow. Oh, no, no. Yeah, no, take no. it. Come on, take it and go. They'll all be there. And there's no cooler spot in town than Pontchartrain Beach on a Sunday afternoon. Can you ring the bell? Just call me Big Nothing. <laughs> Wanna try this one? <laughs> Say, uh, who do I thank for this date anyway? You or the boyfriend? Boyfriend? Well, somebody brought you to this shindig. There it is. Is he blind? Thanks. You in his local? What local? Say, you're really a stranger in paradise. Jack Petty is the business agent for the Longshoremen's Union. Uh-oh, leave it to me to pick on the boss's girl. <laughs> Don't let it throw you. What are you doing here? 
Well, I bought a boat yesterday from a character by the name of Mac McCabe. So today, here I am. So you're the one. And you call him a character? You know about the boat. Well, everybody knows Mac. And anything Mac knows, everybody knows. Am I doing this right? No, I'll check you out. Well, you're different. So are you. In all the right places. Don't skid going around the curves. Got a penny? Oh, baby, you're gonna break me. You know, it isn't every day somebody lays out good cash for a busted up LSM. I'm gonna need a lot of cash. That boat's gonna take a lot of money for repairs. Hey, Alma, you promised me the... Oh, no, shake it easy now. Oh, come on. Come on. You're, you're hurting come me. Come on, you hurt the lady. <laughs> You can hit. You know what he is? Drunk. He's the light heavyweight champ of the Longshoremen's Union. He's still drunk. Who are you, kid? Dan Corbett, president of a boat line. Who are you? Let me handle this, Jack. Get his weight. 175. Every bit of it. You've, um, been eating good. Navy child. Three times a day. Hello, Pete. Hi, Alma. Coffee and donuts. I wouldn't kid you. Everyone at one time or another comes here to the Café du Monde. It's a way of saying good night. Oh, no, wait a minute. I've got my own way of saying good night. After coffee and donuts here, the boy goes to his home and the girl goes to hers. It's an old New Orleans custom. A very lovely custom for two strangers, but by this time, we're no longer strangers. Thanks, Pete. From where I'm sitting, you're still the same fellow I met at the beach today. You should get to bed early and get up early and get yourself a job. You're very lovely and romantic, and I didn't hear a word you said. <laughs> you still need a job. Like I told you, Jack Petty takes good care of his boys, and a smart boy can get ahead. All right. But I'd better stay close to you. Or you might forget. About the job, I mean. Let's not make like I'm a sparring partner. Okay. When do I see you again? I'll be around. I always am. Pop by the Cipador's office tomorrow. I'll try to have some news for you. Well, look, after coffee and donuts, aren't you going to show me any more old Louisiana customs tonight? After coffee and donuts, no more customs tonight. Okay, Charlie, hire your crews. Yes, sir. Charlie Simpson. Who? Oh. Oh, I'm a mean. Hello, Charlie. I'm Danny Corbin. Oh, I've heard about you. You're next Navy man, huh? Jack Petty called about you. He likes to see a good fighter in action. Alma May called Petty. What's her interest? I wouldn't know. Check. So you own half of a ship, hmm? Why do you want to work here on the docks? Eat, learn the ropes. Might come in handy when I get set up. Got a big operation in mind? No, I just want to get ahead, stay there. Check. Say, so, uh, how come all these guys wear cigarettes behind their ears? That means they want to invest in a steady job. Come again. Look, there's 77 wharves in this port. The only way that Zero Saxon can get enough contracts to keep his men busy is to underbid the other companies. It's just one of the tricks of the business. Well, how can they underbid if they pay union rates? Unless they kick back. Kick back? You make it sound like a dirty word. Well, a kickback's a kickback in any language. Sure. Let's say they invest their money. Every man wants to work for Zero Saxon because they know when they work for Saxon, they work every day. It pays off in the long run. Cigarette? Sure.
Wives, they're all the same. They always like to keep you waiting. Music sounds good. Just wait until you taste these famous pork chops of Diamond Jim's. They're really something. Later on, we'll take you around town and show you the real New Orleans. Sounds great. I still don't know anything about the date you've got for me. Ah, uh, something special. Someone you'll really like to meet. Someone that's right up your alley. It's about time. Hi, uh, sweetie. I'm sorry we're late, but we just couldn't help it. Danny, this is my wife, Marie. Danny Corbett. So you're the fellow with the strong right arm. Somebody better introduce me. I'm sorry. This is my brother, Scrappy Durant. Better know you, Scrappy. Yeah, Scrappy used to be quite a fighter. My boss, Zero, managed him until he retired. Now I coach a union boxing team. That's why Joe wanted me to meet you. Words got around that you got a good solid punch. So I'm, I'm glad to meet you. This is my date. Oh, Joe, how <laughs> could you? I'm sure Mr. Corbett was expecting a... What were you expecting? Scrappy, he's lovely. <laughs> Shall we join the ladies? <laughs> Hi, Joe. I've been looking all over town for you. Yeah? I'm sorry, honey. I know. Zero Saxon wants to see you. Danny, Scrappy, take care of Marie, will you? If I'm too late, I'll see you at home. I won't be too long, honey. Bye. Hold on. Come on, tourist. We've still got a lot of sights to show you. Keep the change. Well, now I can really say I've seen New Orleans. I've delivered you safe and sound, and I guess I'd better be going. And now you must come on up. Oh. Well. Oh, excuse me. When Joe called us at the wit's end, he said he'd definitely meet us at home. Come on. OK, if that's what Joe said, but. I've heard about guys who had to go out the window when the husband came home. <laughs> Come on. Sleep on the balcony. I've got a sneaking suspicion he's not home. Sorry you were saddled with my brother and me. I guess it wasn't much fun. I had a swell time. Thanks being polite. No, honestly. You got a beautiful layout here. Must have cost a lot. I'm gonna have one like it soon. When your ship comes in? Oh, you heard about it too. My boat. It should be all mine in about a year. Doesn't that cost a lot of money? It does. But I'll get it somehow. Don't let it cost too much, Dan. What do you mean? You seem like a nice fellow. Stay that way. Nice. You sound like you expect something to happen. Why not? We're living on top of the waterfront. Anything can happen. Like what? I don't know any of the answers. Only questions. But if you're a nice guy like I think, well, nice guys get hurt easily. 
Nice girls get hurt, too. So take care of yourself. And Joe and Scrappy. You're the kind of people I like. So stay that way. Sure. Sure, we'll make a deal. We'll all watch over each other. Did I say something wrong? Let's have dinner together, all of us, sometime. Soon? Soon. So long, Marie. I said so long. Sorry. I was thinking. Thanks for everything. I'll see you to the door. No, no, don't bother. I can find my way out. Say good morning to Joe for me. How are you doing? Okay. That's the last of this lot. Give me the list. I'll check it off in the cargo book. No, I want to do it. I still want to learn all the angles. Hey, you guys! We just unloaded this stuff. It hasn't been checked. What are you doing? Confidentially, we're loading a truck. Confidentially, let's see how fast you can unload it. You guys are picking up the wrong cargo. Let's see your papers. Who filled your papers, bud? Look, I just checked the manifest. This stuff goes by train, not truck. Come on, come on. This guy comes up and starts blowing up a storm. They're loading the wrong cargo. I try to tell him in this joker slug. It's all right. He's a new boy on the docks. He won't pull a trick like that again. Hey, who's crazy here, you or me? All right, boys, let's move cargo. Come on, you men up there, too. Let's go. All right, dock your time. What's the idea of pulling a grandstand trick like that? I told you, Joe, they were moving the wrong cargo. Who's running this wharf, you or me? Look, if there's a mistake, whose responsibility is it? Yours or mine? Okay, Joe. I guess I was over-anxious. Go on, get back to work. Okay. Well, she doesn't look like much yet, but wait till I finish working on her. Sure. Just like a woman. Enough paint, she'll look as good as new. Yeah. All your life, you've had to figure the angles. Then one day along comes an old, rusty, beat-up LSM, and you know you got this whole living deal licked. It's funny. I've never yet found anything that could mean that much to me. Maybe I'm figuring the wrong angles. You're a lonely girl, Alma, baby. Somebody told you. No, I saw it on your face the first day I met you. You're no fun when you're serious. Look, what's the pitch? So far, I don't know a thing about you. Every time I start talking about you, you clam up like I was a one-man investigating committee. Nothing to know. Nobody lives in a vacuum. Hey, that's real deep stuff. Another guy on the hook? One you can't talk about? Can't talk about? Just a guy. Let's, let's talk about the boat, hmm? Look, I'm not the marrying type either. I figured as much. What are you doing tonight? My turn to share the town from top to bottom. I've saved up some dough. You and your boat both know where you're going. Save your money for that. Hello, Danny. Hiya, Scrappy. Danny, I want you to meet a friend of mine, Pete Herman. Pete's the ex bantamweight champ of the world. Pete, this is Danny Corbett. And a friend of Scrappy is a friend of mine. Glad to know you, Pete. Hi, Pete. Hi, Scrappy. Hello, Hi, Ralph. Ralph. Hi. Ralph, you know Danny Corbett? No, I don't believe I do. Danny, this is Ralph Tupas. Hi, Danny. Glad to know you, Ralph. Pleasure. Uh, Pete, can I see you for a second? Excuse me. That's all right. Sure. <sighs> Changed your mind, huh? Decided to fight after all. I need the training to be a longshoreman, huh? Mind if I use the gym? No, go ahead. It's all yours. Thanks a lot. 
Say, uh, Scrappy. Yeah, Danny. You're a friend of Joe's, aren't you? Joe and Marie both, and my whole family. Why? Oh, nothing. I was just wondering how he does it and what he makes as a dark boss. That apartment. Joe's all right, Danny. Well, I didn't say he wasn't. Just that they live very well. Now, look, if you think that... Joe's all right, you hear? Stop shadowboxing with me. I like Joe, too, and Marie. Yeah, I kind of think you do, Dan. So? Well, Dan, it's like... I shouldn't talk it over with you. If not to a friend, who then? Well, it's got me worried, Dan. They're not as happy as they used to be. I thought that was one marriage that would really work out, but now... And now I just don't know. Uh, I'm having dinner with him tonight. Huh? Some sort of celebration, Joe said. Yeah. Marie's making jamba, jamba. Jamba lie. Yeah, that's it. I always thought it was the name of a song. What are they celebrating, you know? I know you got a good right hand, Danny. Octavia, that makes five about all we're set to handle. And that's it. We mustn't be greedy. We're young yet. You smell nice. You've been doing business on us? Well, sure, honey. You're important business. Hello, Zero. Hi, Joe. You suppose we could have a little talk now? Uh, sure. Well, there's something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and now I finally got the chance. How do you mean, Joe? A fellow's offered to set me up in my own stevedoring outfit, so well, I, I'd like to step on. You really think you could pull it off? Big job, big headache. Big chance might mean a big flop. Well, I've learned a few of the tricks from you, Zero, and I, I can get the Franklin Line contract to start with. I'll bet you can at that. Oh, that is naturally if you're not interested in the contract yourself. <laughs> you know I'm not, Joe. I never was. Okay, everybody, let's wish the best of luck to Boss Riley. Oh, Congratulations. Thanks, Zero. Thanks, everybody. How about a drink, Joe? No, I've got to run along. Marie's waiting for me. Thanks, Zero. Bye. He's a nice guy. Say good night, honey. What? Go powder your nose and straighten your seams or something. Be a good girl, baby. Oh, sure. You know something? He'll go far. You gonna let him walk out just like that? Any time he decides to talk and close us up. No kidding. Take care of that. I want it back. We don't get rid of it? Uh-uh. Not yet. Come on. Bye, Zero. It's like I told you upstairs, fellas. Marie's waiting for me with dinner. So she wait a little longer. Sure, what's the rush? Oh, it's really getting late. I gotta get going. Looks like your hand's kind of stuck to my arm. Let's go someplace. And talk.
seen the Carter Two Sisters. Remember? Yeah, what's happening? Oh, she's Joe's been working hard lately. Later and later every night. Tough. He says he's got something big planned. Maybe it'll give him a lot of spare time. I hope it's a good deal for both of you. How can it be? Well, that's a funny approach. Joe's working hard, isn't he? Too hard. You can't condemn him for trying. I don't. I don't have to like what he's after. All right, I give up. What's he after? The brass ring on a merry-go-round. Doesn't have a brass ring. I see. Now I know absolutely nothing. Good drink. Thanks. It's my own recipe. Don't ask me what's in it. It's never the same twice. Joe's trying hard to get on top. Is that wrong? He was a stevedore when I met him. I fell in love with Joe the stevedore, not Joe the, the big man on top. I married Joe the stevedore. I was happy. I don't want success or power or big money, just... just Joe. A man's got a right to dream. You're part of that dream. Just like my boat's part of my dream. And I want the big money someday, too. Is that a crime? Yes. When it's a crime against oneself. Spell that out. He's changed too much. People grow up. Can't he grow up without hurting himself? That's the gamble a man takes if he wants to get somewhere. You mean that he'll never be satisfied? The more he has, the more he wants? I'm wasting my time. Joe won't be happy till he makes the big move. And now the time has come. Is this something you know, or did you just dream it up? The big deal is being made tonight. Joe wanted it to be a surprise. But when I found out he was talking to Zero Saxon, well, I wouldn't be much of a wife if I couldn't take it from there. Here's to you, Joe, and the big deal. You don't know any reason why somebody would want to kill him? Like I said, Superintendent, everybody liked Joe Riley. Your best friend is found floating in the Mississippi with four slugs in him, and you don't want to talk to us. Are you afraid? I just don't know anything about it, that's all. I'd help you out if I could. OK, go ahead, Charlie. You can go. I'm <laughs> sorry, Superintendent. Well, what do you make of it, Superintendent? He may be telling the truth. Then again, he may be afraid to talk. What's he afraid of? If this were New York and a DACA was murdered, I'd guess he was mixed up in a racket but not in New Orleans. No, we don't have rackets in New Orleans. All at once, the three men had the same thought. How sure were they that the rackets hadn't moved into New Orleans? Wayne Brandon said he knew that racketeers had cost New York 150 million in pilfered cargo alone. He was scared. Al Chittenden explained what this would mean to his union, an all-out battle to keep criminals and racketeers from exploiting his men. And police superintendent Schurling said if rackets took over the 42-mile waterfront, He'd need not a police force, but an army.
Uh-uh. Are they... Are they sure that it's Joe? Yeah. You know, you're... You're wonderful taking it like this. Am I? I've cried for days. I... I don't think I can cry anymore. I knew he wasn't coming back. I knew they killed him. I knew that Joe wanted to quit. But he didn't come home. I knew right away what had happened. Just because he wanted to go into business for himself, Marie, it doesn't add up. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I know. The man I married didn't just disappear. I lost him a long time ago. I started working for Zero Saxon. investigator for the Maritime Insurance Group. He's checking into some lost cargoes. I want you to get in full cooperation, all the help you can. Well, what shipment was it? Here's a signed receipt for cargo delivered to this dock. It never arrived in Europe. Well, who's this F.A. Wilson? The guy that signed it? Why, the checker. Never been a checker by the name of Wilson on this wharf. Never heard of him? You know what I think? Mr. Chambers, somebody forged that signature. Why, I'll bet that cargo was hijacked before it ever reached this dock. Mind if I look around, watch your handling procedure? Help yourself. I guess that's all. Yes, Mr. Saxon. Look, Mac, I said nobody opened these crates. All right, then I won't move them. You pick on that load. We'll get your rig out of here. Well, we call the union. Yeah. Go ahead, call them. Read the rules. The driver's got a right to examine any cargo. He can refuse to pick it up. What's the trouble, driver? The last time I picked up a load here, I got a hold of the wrong stuff. This time I want to see what I'm getting or I don't move it. Why don't you check the crate markings? I checked them last time. I still got the wrong cargo. I don't understand. Can't we open a couple of crates just to satisfy him? Oh, you let one driver open the crates at all, one of them. We'd have pilferage and losses all over the docks. You have plenty of losses right now. What are you doing? Writing an order, impounding the cargo. I have the authority. Impounding it? Maybe there's nothing wrong. But we've paid too many losses lately to take a chance. Mr. Chambers, I think you're putting yourselves in a lot of trouble for nothing. We'll see. But you better warn your men, Saxon. I'm posting a guard on this wharf, and if anybody touches one of these crates before my investigation, he goes to jail. That's a deal you stepped into, Ed. We can't touch it without going to jail. Once Chambers opens a crate, we're through. A Hiram boss has got to know something about handling delicate cargo. How about it? What do you think I got sent up for? The reason I ask, Dura Chemicals got a big shipment going out of Julia Street Wharf tonight. Here, take a look. Wow. Those solvents are tricky. Juggle them wrong and they'll blow up in your face. That's what I thought. It's kind of a tough deal for somebody new on a job. But you pull this off, Ed, you got a three-year contract with Clear Sailing. How about it? Keep that guard up. Danny? Hey, when are you gonna work out? Well, not tonight. A few minutes ago on the night shift. You don't want to overdo that working department, you know. Got you. The boat? Yeah. How you doing in the dough department, Dan? That must cost a lot of scratch. Not too good. Cost too much just to live. Huh? You ever think of fighting, Dan? Oh, I don't mean amateur. I mean pro. That's big money and quick. Can't be so great if you quit. Got a great record, right on top. All of a sudden, boom, you retire. Can't be such a great career. You're gonna be late for work, Danny. You know you're right. What, are you soft in the head?
crazy? What are you trying to do? what it is, it's rotten. I still don't see what you mean, Al. All right, then I'll lay it on a line. I've been around this union a long time. I can smell a rotten setup a mile away. And I've been telling you for three hours, you got one in your local. You just let me What's explain. What's to explain? A foeman murdered? An insurance investigator ties up cargo for examination? Go on, explain why it just happens to be destroyed in a dock fire on one of your wharfs. Those things happen, Al. You know, the waterfront. One of my boys stopped what could have been a big fire. Is that rotten? That doesn't explain why the men won't talk about the murder or the fire. They're afraid to talk. They're scared of what, Jack? How should I know? If they're scared, why don't they come to their business agent for help? I'll tell you why. They don't trust you. Well, if there is a mess, which I don't admit, don't I at least deserve a chance to clean it up myself? All right, Jack. I'll give you one last chance. Clean up this mess or you're through as business agent of your local. I don't understand. Don't anybody ever bring me any good news? I can't help it. Things are getting tough. You know what Chambers thinks about that fire. And making an ex-con your new hiring boss didn't help either. You gotta do something, Zero. You mean besides paying you all that grease? If Al cans me, I'm no good to you. Grease or no grease. If Al knew the local was solid for you, had confidence in you, trusted you, he wouldn't dare kick you out, would he? No, but how's he gonna think that? Well, supposing the boys threw you a testimonial dinner, sort of a spontaneous tribute to their business agent. I ain't heard anything about a spontaneous tribute. That's because we didn't tell him about it yet. Stupid. You're stupid. Don't worry, they'll kick in. They'll show up, too. You better get your tux clean. That ought to do it, Zero. That just ought to do it. You know something that would really put the nuts on a cake with Al? Give him a hero. For instance? For instance? A nice, clean boy who Jack Petty gave a break to on the docks. A boy who repaid his trust and confidence by putting out a fire that could have cost the city a million bucks. Yeah, I already told Al about that young smoke eater. Uh, I might even do something for him myself. What was his name again? Yeah, what was his name again? Dan. Dan Corbett. message that you want me to stop by. I hope you like martinis. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Zero thinks I'm quite a talent scout. What's the gag? No gag. You've got a bona fide invitation and I've got to deliver you. What difference does it make to Zero whether I get to Jack Petty's dinner or not? You'll find out. Later. You know, you're quite a guy. Fighting. Putting out fires. You're better at starting them. You were Zero's friend. I'm my own friend. I do as I please. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't very often that a man will risk his life over and above the call of his job. You know about the incident of which I speak. You've read it in your newspapers. I wonder what would have happened if this fire had gotten away. 
It probably would have meant a lot of docks burnt, millions of dollars of property loss, and lives, and been a disaster in our community. And it was all prevented by this one man. And so tonight gives me a great deal of pleasure to have an honor performed here, and I'm going to call on the chief of the New Orleans Fire Department, Howard L. Day, to present a certificate of merit to this courageous young man, Chief Day. Thank you, Councilman Schiro. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the citizens of New Orleans, it gives me great pleasure in presenting this certificate of merit to an outstanding hero, Mr. Daniel Carvin. What idea was that? Go on, go on up, go on. Now, I've got something to say. Starting tomorrow, if he wants to, Dan can go to work for me as assistant hiring boss on Congress Street Wharf. How about it, Danny? The pay's good. You want the job? Do I? And who do you suppose picked our young hero? Gave him his break on the docks. That's right, our guest of honor, Jack Petty. Now, you know, Jack, he hates to make speeches. But even without speeches, Jack knows how we all feel about him. But in case he should ever forget, the boys in his local all chipped in and got him a little reminder. And I think it only proper that President L of the Union should make a presentation. How about it? Danny, you just hit the jackpot. This is a beautiful, solid gold cigarette case. And it's engraved to Jack Petty. A real guy from his boys. Congratulations, Jack. Thanks, Al. And just so everybody will go home with something, there are souvenirs for the ladies. Come on, pass them all out. Expensive stuff, huh? Zero always thinks things are okay if they smell pretty. Compliments of Zero Saxon. Cost every man on the dock a day's pay. I can't stay, Charlie. I came to a memorial tribute to Joe and nothing else. Yeah, I had enough laughs. Hi, everybody. Looks like my night to buy the drinks, huh? Congratulations on your new job, Danny. Thanks. I'm sure you make a lot of money with Zero. You make it sound like that's bad. That's just fine. Get it any way you can. That's what they always say. Coming? Night, Dan. Miss Worth. We were just leaving. Scrappy? I think I'll stick around a while, Marie. You go home with Sue and Charlie. Good night, Sue. Charlie. Good night. Dan, can I talk to you a while alone? Go ahead. I'll dance with Zero. A little while, okay? Okay. I don't know why, but I sure laid an egg with Marie and Charlie. There's a lot of things you don't know, Dan. One of them is how much you hurt Marie. Hurt Marie? Oh. Dan, look, we both like you. She doesn't want to see you get all mixed up the way Joe did. You're going to give me a line about Zero? Look, I've been keeping my mouth shut, but my ears and eyes are working overtime. That's Stevedore Corporation of Zeros. That's just a cover-up for his real operation, big-time smuggling and pilfering on the docks. And that dame you're with tonight, she's the one that fingers the cargoes for him, where she only works in the Stevedore contracting office to get information for Zero. You're crazy. I've worked on Zero's docks. He couldn't possibly get away with it. Oh, yeah? Did you ever hear the old shell game? Under which walnut is the pea? Where do you think he's doing it? All right. I'll explain it to you some other time. Maybe you're right. Maybe not. But why pick on me? I told you, Danny, we like you. You think I'd be sticking my neck out like this if I didn't think you were being played for a sucker? Suppose I work for Zero, and I tell him how you feel. 
I don't think you're a squealer, Danny. It's like uh, you scratch my back and so forth. You saved us a bundle by putting out that fire. Now we want to do you a turn. So we'll pay you 200 a week to start. 200? That's only a start. Later on, you make good, you get a cut of the business like Joe did. I never thought I'd make that much money without stealing it. What are you getting at, kid? From all I've heard, you operate just like everybody else, only smarter. Well, sure, kid. You gotta be smart unless you want to work in a bargain basement. All I want is to own my own boat and head up the river to the tall timber. Up the river, tall timber. Well, I like poetry. So get some sleep. We'll see you later. Coming? Oh, we'll see she gets home all right. Uh, don't think we blame you, Danny boy, for being careful. As a matter of fact, we appreciate it. We don't want to hire the wrong guy either. Yeah. I like poetry, too. I'll see you. See you. Who got to him? How do you mean? You didn't hear nothing on the docks, I could tell. Somebody got to him after I offered him the job at the banquet. I saw him talking to Scrappy. They always yapped like two old maids. I noticed how Scrappy's changed ever since Joe Riley was killed. He just might talk too much. Marie's his sister, and he's her brother. You know what I mean? We can't stand the heat of another killing. Unless maybe we got Scrappy one more fight. Blank squealer. An A1 stoolie. That's why you gotta be a little more careful who you talk to. The little punk went to the boss and told him everything you said. Do yourself a favor. From now on, keep your lip buttoned up. Let him go, stupid. All right, that's enough. Scrappy! Okay, double crosser. I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. <laughs> Come on, fight! What's the matter? I hit you too hard? You want to run and tell Zero about it? Scrappy, come on, get your hands up, fight! Months ago, he was talking to do some big Mike. Now, take it easy, kid. <laughs> Accidents happen. Nobody can explain them. You didn't kill him. He had no right to fight. I tell you, I killed him. I don't know. He seemed sore about something. I don't know why. He kept hitting me and hitting me. Then I hit him. Just once. It wasn't hard. I hit a lot of guys harder. And Scrappy was a fighter. He went down. He never moved. I've been trying to figure it. Why? Why? His heart. What about his heart? He had a, a bad heart. A doctor told him another fight would kill him. Who knew about this? Just a few. Scrappy was too proud to let on. That's why he quit the fight ring. Zero and Noah used to manage him. Deuce and Big Mike were there. They'd been talking to him. 
Okay. Let me have the port commission office, please. Uh, Brandon, please. Mr. Brandon. Uh, Mr. Brandon, this is Dan Corbett. The secret meeting between Dan Corbett and Wayne Brandon took place in the private quarters of the Hampshire, an exclusive businessman's club. Brandon invited police superintendent Shearing and Al Chittenden to sit in with them. Dan began by telling them his idea of the reason for Scrappy's death. Somehow, through Mike and Deuce, Zero managed to get Scrappy in the ring with me. The rest you know. Just what is Zero's setup? Big time pilfering, mainly. But with sidelines, smuggling, kickbacks, Special collection, short gangs. Now you see why I wanted you two here. I just don't see how Zero can get away with pilfering. It has to be a big operation with contacts to finger the cargoes. Zero's got a girl planted in the Stevedore's Contracting Association. The checkers and dock bosses are in on it. He even operates the new Dixie truck line as a blind. But with label crates, ships manifest, signed receipts, how can he manage it? Well, the way Scrappy explained it, it was like the old shell game. Here, I'll try to show you what I mean. Al, would you pass me a couple of those matches? A couple of them. The shells. But instead of using shells, Zero uses a ship, a warehouse, and a truck. Oh, yes. Instead of one P, he uses two, just to make it more complicated. Now, let's say that this is the valuable cargo Zero wants. It's on the ship, and it's unloaded on, say, Fortress Street Wharf. Now, Zero sends down one of his trucks, brings in a load of crates marked exactly the same way as the valuable cargo. P number two. In the dock warehouse, the papers are switched from the original cargo, the legitimate cargo, to the phony crates. The truck comes in, picks up the phony crates instead of the cargo it should have. And one of the insurance companies will lick Try to trace that transaction back months later. Afterward, when things are quiet, Zero sends back his truck to pick up the valuable cargo. What about shipments going abroad? We just reverse the process, load the phony crates on the ship. By law, Zero has to keep exact dock records. They have been inspected, so you'd have to doctor the cargo book and keep a file of phony invoices. And Gene Lafitte thought he was a pirate. All we have to do now is to tail Zero's new Dixie trucks whenever one leaves the docks. No, that's no good. Because that cargo may be reloaded two or three times. Maybe even recrated. Even so, if we stop the trucks, we stop Zero. Until we find out where the trucks finally end up. What about radio? The Navy used radio oscillators and directional antenna as locators. Now, if we could plant one of those small transmitting oscillators in the stolen cargo on the docks, by your radio cars that have no trouble following that cargo, no matter how many times it was transshipped. Our radio section could rig up the oscillators, but, but then... But what? There's, but there's still a matter of planting them in the right cargoes. I think I could take care of that. Zero just made me assistant dock boss. I could keep that job until the oscillators are planted. I guess I don't have to warn you if Zero should find out you talk to us. No, you don't. I remember what happened to Joe Riley and Scrappy. Brandon will notify you when the oscillators are ready. Then it'll be up to you. You'll be on your own. Be careful. Good luck. It'll be worth a try. Thank you, gentlemen. Not long after the meeting, Dan got his chance to place one of the oscillators. What do you think you're doing? Oh, the uh, corner of the case was smashed. I was just nailing it up. Anybody catch you doing that kind of work, you'll have the union on your neck. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, see, I don't know all the union rules yet. As soon as Zero Saxon's new Dixie truck pulled out with the shipment containing the oscillator, the police car's antenna was quick to spot it, and it was easy to follow the shipment. All right, 
Target stop, transship once. Seem to have settled down for the night. Bearing 137. 137, Pointer Street Wharf. This is Unit 30, Lafayette and Delta, final bearing 286. 286, Lafayette and Delta. Well, there it is. That's where our transmitter ended up. You know that location, Superintendent. Do I? One of the biggest warehouses in the city, Challenge Distributors. Big firm, important, respectable, so to speak. Doesn't seem possible. They could be handling stolen goods. We'll know for sure when we raid them. But first, we must find out how many more outlets Zero has. Only a short time later, after following through the same procedures, Police Superintendent Schoring had his information. Besides challenge distributors, Zero had two more outlets, General Wholesale and last, Ace Storage. Now, they were ready to move in on zero. Hey, Frank. What's this all about? I thought I'd better bring it. It was in one of the crates from the docks. Smart. I don't like clever people. What is it, Zero? It's a small transmitter to trace those crates by radio. The police? You better pack all the stuff back in the crates like it was. Get it back on the docks pronto. What about the dock records? They check those receipts against the cargo book. We'll fix the records. Get going. What are you doing? I thought I'd call up and get the boys started. If they planted oscillators, I'd bug the phone too. Do as I told you. OK, Zero. This thing didn't crawl in that crate by itself. Somebody helped it. Somebody who's a little too clever to be around. Anywhere. Jim? Yeah. This is Mike. Look, I think there's an undercover police car across the street, so I can't come in. The boss wants you to pack all those crates. All of them. Yeah. The boss wants you to pack all those crates, just like they were and get them back to the docks. Right. What? What about the wreck? Zero will take care of that. You just get those crates back to the dock quick. Right. If that cargo gets back on the docks, our evidence is gone. If we stop the trucks, they'll know we're monitoring their warehouse calls. I think we can fix that. Hello? Al speaking. Yeah, I want all the men pulled off zero Saxon stocks. Right now. Yeah, it's a strike. Too many accidents. Whatever signs you got. And get this. Tell the pickets to let no one on or off the docks. Right. Zero will never put that stolen cargo back now. Not through our picket lines. See you later. Who could it be? We checked on everybody had a chance to do it. Could it be Alma May? Chance to do what? Plan a, an Oscalay or, or you know what I mean, uh, something to put in a crate or something like that. A what? She didn't do it. Oh. It had to be planted on the docks. Whoever did it knew what we were after. Opened the crate, stuck it in, then nailed it up again. Have you checked Dan Corbett? Why? 
I caught him nailing up one of those crates. He said it was smashed. Nah, he's too new. He could never figure out the setup this fast. Wait a minute. He's clever. He's smart. And he talked to Scrappy a little too much. Ed, you better bring him up here, quick. Zero, I think you're right. This is special unit A outside the Challenge Warehouse. Loaded truck just came out of the building and turned down toward the docks. Over. OK, we've got it. Just sit tight where you are. This is Superintendent Shuring. Dispatch the three special details to the warehouse. I'll be with the dock detail. Yes, sir. What are we doing, plant catch? We were wondering if you'd ever seen it before, that's all. What is it? How would I have seen it before? When you planted it in that smashed cargo crate on the docks. Very clever and smart, Danny boy. Now don't start acting dumb. Talk. Sorry, pal. President Al's orders. Nobody gets on this dock till the strike's over. What do you want me to do? Beat it. OK, OK. Hold it. Yeah. What? A picket line on all my docks? No, you sit tight. We'll handle it. The union boss has pulled all his men out for contract violations. A truck can't get through the picket line. That does it. Ed, you and Deuce get down to Molly's and the fat Frenchman's. Pay the boys anything you have to. Tell them they're going to bust the picket line. Start enough trouble to draw any guards away from the office so I can get rid of the cargo records. Get going. Why give him a gun? Because it's the one that killed Joe Riley, that's why. If he has talked, a nice murder charge complete with a beautiful set of fingerprints might make him change his testimony. I'll leave you to watch him. Strike, Charlie? That's what the signs say. Better get your boys out of the way. We're unloading a ship for zero. And if your men try to stop us, they're going to get hurt. Nobody crosses that line. Zero, it'll be nothing short of murder. Trust me, I'll go to bat for you. Shut up, you punk. Oh! All right, Danny boy. Now you can tell the police how I helped you.
date, but she's almost mine. What do you think of her? <laughs> you know, I never quite believed that boat story. Well, that's a fine attitude. <laughs> Don't blame me, lady. I try to talk him out of it. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin on the Zero Saxon case. On the basis of additional evidence from the New Orleans Police Crime Laboratory, the grand jury this morning indicted Floyd Zero Saxon for the murder of Joe Riley. Ballistic tests proved conclusively that the bullets taken from a young longshoreman named Corbett were fired from the same gun as those found. You know, it's lucky Zero was such a good shot. Just suppose he missed you. Say, if you two are gonna start painting the boat, you better get going. Okay, Captain. So a young California ex-sailor trying to buy a boat happened to be the key to breaking the waterfront dictatorship of Zero Saxon, which had threatened the position of historic New Orleans as the second greatest port of the United States. <laughs>